Um, and scientific practices more generally, um, shows perhaps the artist's side of the story in the, uh, in the presentation that Lawrence just gave uh, earlier. So this is why I think, well, I'm going to attempt to give a definition for art as well, but, uh, that isn't based on um, tautological and arbitrary things. Um, so, uh, so, what a lot of my thinking about doing this or putting together this presentation was influenced by something that Mona talked about on Monday um, uh, when she was presenting about, uh, or the, in the presentations about wasted research and, uh, and the problems with, uh, with research questions. And the problem that she saw with um, discrepancies between uh, the phenomena which you are claiming to measure um, and the correlates. Of that phenomenon. Um, so what it is you actually are measuring. Uh, and she used an example of a particularly um, horrifying looking piece of research about sexual dysfunction, where um, a list of nine different criteria were used, I think, to identify uh, sexual dysfunction within a, a group of subjects um, that found very, very high um, and diagnosed a very, very high number of uh, people within that, that, that category. And so one of the things that I want to talk about today is, is not these problems within the science itself. Um, clearly there's a, there's a problem with the way in which sexual dysfunction itself is then turned into a, a list of checkboxes. Um, but what I want to talk really is what's, what's the outcome of that, of that thinking? What's the outcome of the decisions that you make when you decide what your phenomenon is? What are the, what's the outcome of, of, of description? Now, um, there's a huge amount of literature uh, that you can draw on in the sociology of science, um, in the anthropology of medicine, in the philosophy of science and technology that talks about some of these, uh, the way in which scientific ideas uh, and medical ideas and those cultures uh, construct or, um, or interact with uh, the publics and the people that they describe to construct certain types of experience, certain subjectivities, um, certain types of illness, for example. But I want to look beyond illness in particular. I'm going to look most of the other stuff that I'm going to use. So there's two people that I draw on. Um, uh, in particular, uh, Michel Foucault uh, is probably the um, intellectual grandfather of, of a lot of this thinking. Um, I'm going to use quite a few examples that Ian Hacking, amongst others, has, has used. And what Hacking is interested in, what he uh, talks about in his example that I'm going to talk about, is what people might be rather than what they are. And that there's a very in important distinction, I think, uh, between uh, thinking of the science that you're doing as being something that describes what people are, what human nature is, and and describing what people might be, what people might become. And understanding that the interventions you make by describing those people has an effect. I'm not sure if I'm preaching to the converted, but I think there's some interesting things that we can explore um, in this idea. And in particular, I want to make a connection, to, if I have time, can I make a connection to the arts? Because that's where I think that the interesting connection between the arts and the sciences is, is that the science <coughs> I don't know, I'm making massive generalisations. But in the sciences, you might understand what you're doing as being about revealing the truth, about revealing the world that is out there. But what you're actually doing is within that world. It affects that world and it constructs how it works. Um, so 
how we understand and experience that world, uh, instructs people, and human scientists in particular, um, that you know, things aren't that simple. Um, and that's where I think that something creative is happening, and that's why I think we're pursuing this there and being involved in this process. So, I wish you could read the text here, but I will tell you what it says. This is from a children's book, and it shows an example of an experiment. It says, the first picture shows a child balanced on a seesaw looking at a toy. The second shows how more blood goes to her brain and her head sinks when she thinks or works out a sum. <laughs> uh, some of you might perhaps be able to tell me whether or not increased blood flow is, does correlate with, uh, with max questions. Um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, apparently the people who are daydreaming have the most blood flow. Um, but what I want to get you guys thinking about is the question of how does this experiment change the world that it's called? Yeah, it gives an, a, a material explanation for thinking and problem solving because the brain does the problem solving. Okay. Uh -huh. So it gives a particular type of explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So, it, okay. Yes. Great. Uh, what, we've got two things happening. The work is more effortful than play. Uh -huh, okay, so it makes a claim about work being more effortful than play, but also it creates two characters. <coughs> characters. Categories. So work and play are, are, are separated from one another. Anything else? Seesaw. Okay, yeah. Oh, so the seesaw is quite important as well. So it, it, it gives us an apparatus that we can use in order to know about thought as well. It creates something, a uh, material, or repurposes a particular object um, and recruits it to a use in showing us the differences between two types of mental experiments. So the, there's, there's lots of things being moulded and brought together. So with that in mind, we'll go back to the thing. I'm going to run out of time, but I'll speed up. So two people, uh, René Descartes and Francis Bacon, uh, both understood... So Francis Bacon, I'm not really going to talk about uh, Descartes. They're both um, important figures. Uh, in um, uh, the early modern thinking and, uh, and very influential on Enlightenment thinking and, and the Enlightenment and, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the creation of, ex of a, an understanding of exper an experimental science. Oh, sorry. So Bacon, in particular, um, wrote a text called the Novum Organum, um, the new instrument of science. Uh, where um, he attempted to uh, propose a new type of science, a new type of scientific practice, um, which uh, dealt with a problem that Descartes as, as well had identified. And this problem was that if you want to have an empirical uh, understanding of the world, and take an empirical approach to the world, so that your knowledge comes from the world rather than from the knowledge that you've inherited from other people, um, um, then you need to uh, get around the problem of the senses. So both Descartes, uh, very famously, and Bacon uh, uh, raised this issue and talked about this issue. So um, Bacon, the organon is kind of a, ma a manual for the new empirical science. And one, one of the things that he says is that, that by far the greatest hindrance and aberration of the human understanding proceeds from the dullness, incompetency, and deceptions of the senses. So human direct information uh, treated very, very uh, is a real kind of problem. But what uh, Bacon, unlike Descartes, does is suggest that we can use experiments from things in nature and manipulations of nature in order to find to get around this problem. So Descartes says, I want to reason from first principles uh, and use logic to build up a system of knowledge. 
Bacon says, let's get out there, let's do experiments. So these are some of the, the, the list of uh, idols, problems with human perception that we have and human culture that cause us to uh, not uh, to be blind to the reality of the world out there. So the tribe, our, our, human, our, our faulty eyes, our inability to see certain things or be distracted by things. Um, the cave, our personal bias or prior experience. Theatre, the existing sciences, the sophistry of, the, of our inherited knowledge. And the marketplace, discourse and language. Um, so he kind of picks these things apart. And he says that um, what we need to do is use things like instrumentation uh, in order to improve our senses. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with this. Um, to improve our senses, um, to, to magnify things, for example, and also to direct the senses, to structure our perceptions. So um, things like measurement rules and these kinds of things. So technology, he says, we need to get, get these technologies and use them. Um, and he, he lists in the organic a huge connect, collection of uh, different techniques that can be used to put to the, the use, put to use in science. Um, so he says, in introducing the organ, I set down at length all experiments of the mechanical arts, a history not only of nature free and large, but much more of nature under constraint and vexed. And this is one of the key things that I want to draw out about the organ. Therefore the nature of things constrains itself more readily under the vexations of art than in its natural freedom. And it's this, uh, so rather than, so Bacon is still talking about nature here, he's still talking about a world that we need to go out there and discover what, what it is. Um, but we're not going to just observe it, we're going to get in there and start vexing it. So I, I really like the um, image as, as a kind of uh, experiment. So at the bottom it says, uh, training by laboratory workers has overcome the human fear of firearms. So Bacon's giving, giving us the, um, well he's making the suggestion that we should go out there, he's telling us to get out there and influence the world, to experiment on it. So, and the things that we introduce are not things that already exist when we do. So the vexation of nature is a practice that produces uh, phenomena within a laboratory um, context. And effects. Uh, and Ian Hacker makes a nice um, uh, distinction between these two things. So he says that scientific phenomena tend to be things that we observe, um, like uh, astronomical um, uh, phenomena. Um, and effects, we tend to use the word effect to more talk about things that are produced in the laboratory. Then one of the examples that he uses is the Hall effect, uh, which is the production of uh, electrical currents by a magnetic field. And E.H. Hall. Um, uh, observe this. Um, the Hall effect does not exist outside certain kinds of apparatus. This is what Hacking says about it. Its modern equivalent has become technology, reliable and routinely produced. The effect, at least in a pure state, can only be embodied by such devices. Nowhere outside of the laboratory is there such a pure arrangement. In nature, there is just complexity, which we are remarkably able to analyse. We do so by distinguishing in the mind numerous different laws. We also do so by presenting in the laboratory pure isolated phenomena, such as lack of with firearms. So, uh, hacking updates this and talks about the about lasers as well as being something else that, as far as to current knowledge, I'm not I'm no expert. I could be wrong as of now, but lasers don't exist naturally. They just exist on, on Earth, and they're a product of yeah, they're, they're a laboratory product, they're a product of science. So there's something else going on here. When we talk about discovering the truth, getting access to reality, uh, finding out about nature, all these things, the, the, the actual practices that we're engaged in are much more creative, they're productive, they're producing uh, armed animals, they're producing things like lasers, they're producing things like various effects and phenomena that aren't found anywhere else. It doesn't mean that they're not real, they're very real, probably, well, probably more real than other things. So the most synthetic things in our lives, the most man-made things like chairs for example, 
of things that we've produced. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So there's a there's masses of literature about um, about the the questions and ideas that are raised by this by looking at what about at techno science, the scientific practice that is completely enmeshed within the or constructed around the, the use of technology. That can be technologies of inscription, of, of, of instrumentation, it can be technologies of, of writing and communicating and building up uh, um, criteria for objectivity, um, of, of technologies of publishing, all the social technologies that um, help us to decide what is the uh, what is the agreement between us about what we decide is going to be found. Um, so, uh, and there's lots of people gasping, but I could give you, anyone wants to read more stuff about this, ask me and I'll, I'll to look at. Um, uh, in particular, I've pointed to, I'm going to talk about the human sciences now, making up people, which is one of the things that Ian Hacken talks about. Um, but there, there are also authors who've looked at, Karen Barad in particular, looks at Niels Bohr's writing um, on Heisenberg and um, uh, uh, fundamental physics research, and also makes the claim that experimentation in um, uh, quantum physics also has the effects of production and the uncertainty principle. So it, you can make this claim about a number of different sets of, of practice. Also, um, just Hans Jörg Reinberger as well uh, writes about the life sciences. And the amazing way in which uh, molecular biology um, uh, is based on uh, a set now of, of very, very um, specialised uh, tools um, that are taken to stand for, for considered to stand for nature, but are really an investigation of, of a very complex kind of technological system. So things like um, in vitro experimentation um, using genetically engineered organisms like Drosophila. Um, uh, cell lines, all these kinds of things are, are t technological tools that um, have been developed in, in this kind of context. So I wanted to talk about the sciences themselves as a creative practice. I don't know how many of you want to punch me at this point, but I'm going to carry on. Um, and and the, one of the reasons that I, I think this is important while thinking about is that by describing people, and I'm going to look at some examples of this, we can contribute to what it is to be those people, what it is to experience your own um, embodiment, your own subjective. Um, and, and those descriptions are adopted by um, you know, medicine, uh, people who provide services, the penal system, education, even if you want to look at the, the kind of basic implications of the science that we do, not even that, you know, if I know that, for instance, depression is genetic, that changes how I deal with being depressed. In an absolutely fundamental way. So people's self-knowledge really, really changes how they live. Um, so I think that's, that's quite creative to be describing or changing the descriptions. Um, so I was going to talk quickly about art. Oh, okay. So, in, uh, this is um, Jiri. I thought I'd just grab a definition of art. Um, uh, <laughs> hopefully it's slightly... there's more to it. Um, so he says that in common conception, the work of art is often identified with the building, book, painting, or statue in its existence apart from human experience. Um, and the task is to... this is the book, the task of book art as experience, which is pretty much on the first page of. The task is to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings and sufferings that are universally recognised to constitute experience. And I think I, I'm going to talk a bit about artistic media, media and research in, in media um, very quickly because I think that's quite an important to think about why artists are interested in science and technology, or interested in techno science. Um, so, but I, I think Jerry's uh, definition here is really useful for us. So it's it's a form of experience. That's the key thing. And I think that when we describe people, we change how they're able to experience being themselves. Um, 
So since the, this is where I, uh, so another art lesson. Um, so one of the things that art does by definition is explores, or, okay, I'll say it, uh, is explores the boundaries of, of uh, its, its own medium, of, of artistic medium. So the example of the Duchamps Rhino that we saw earlier is, is, is it kind of falls into that category. So I was going to uh, show some of Duchamp's work. This is, these are, no, oh, here we go. This is the large glass, or actually it's a recreation of the large glass, which is a, a um, mixed media work uh, by Duchamp, um, which he created, uh, it's called, so the bride stripped bare by her bachelor's eating uh, the large glass. Um, and it's a work that um, Duchamp made um, that explores 2025? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? 25? Yeah. 25, yeah. And the Pad Thai beef, number 22. Yeah. Moment for reflection. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a Duchamp scholar, I'm quite actually scared of talking about him because there's some people who are like amazing Sherlock Duchamp sleuths. And uh, I, because of the way that he worked, he created, he created this object, the large glass, which um, contains um, some really abstract symbolism. And uh, supposedly, the, the glass um, uh, it tells a story of, of uh, human sexuality. Um, in that the, we have here the bachelors here, there's a coffee grinder, this is the bride. I, 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 I actually am no, no expert in the symbolism here, but um, what Duchamp is, does is supports this object with a set of boxes of notes. And, and in fact, what I think the large glass is, is not just an object, a painting that you look at, but it's actually a, a complex, um, construction, construction, collection of different of ideas and analogies. The glass points at many, many different um, ideas. So, to the extent that Duchamp scholars spend time, you know, there's a wasp. The bride is wasp wasted, apparently, and and they spend all their their time trying to figuring out what this symbolism means in terms of the history of his life and his experiences and the culture of the time, because the the glass is is a um, collects together all this symbolism and different ideas about technology and sexuality and all these things, condenses them, but then explodes them again by um, being made available in these boxes of his notes, which are, you know, things that he wrote on napkins at dinner time throughout the course of the period of time that he worked on the glass. So there's, there's you know, Duchamp at one point, this is just after he was making paintings, um, and he starts to kind of explode. Where's the where's the art object here? Where's the? Um, um, I was going to show uh, this piece by Tom Friedman, um, just because I think it's, uh, it's it's probably my favourite artwork. Um, so I guess I'm showing it because of that. <laughs> it. Um, it's uh, uh, it's called Untitled A Curse, and it's an 11 inch sphere of space floating 11 inches above the top of a pedestal cursed by a witch. <laughs> I'm sure some of you. Oh, Emperor's New Clothes, I think it would be. Um, <coughs> I think there's something really interesting about the, the encounter that a person would have with the sphere of Earth air that had been cursed by a witch. I mean, that raises some really interesting questions. I don't know about, about maybe some. Would it, like, who would put their hand? Would you put your hand in the sphere of air cursed by a witch? Mm -hmm. Of course. Because <laughs> so, you don't believe in. What would, aren't you worried? Yes. Okay, so you, what would you experience when you put your hand into a sphere of air? A thrill. A what? Thrill. A thrill? Yeah. Okay, so what, that's quite interesting, I think, that we, mm -hmm. you, we can produce this, this uh, put in a, a photograph or a phrase, you know, even in our minds, we can produce something, a certain type of experience with a certain intensity um, yeah, that tells us something about ourselves. I'm going to skip through these because otherwise. So, um, lots of conceptual artists have explored these ideas in the 1960s. We have people like Yoko Ono, who I think uh, made a few very, very nice pieces of instruction work. 
uh, such as this. Observe three paintings carefully, mix them in your head. And these are instructions for things that you should actually carry out. You know, and she says the only place that you can do this is in your imagination. So the the artworks can be made in this place. And this is wonderful. Imagine your body spreading rapidly all over the world like thin tissue. Uh, cut out the same size rubber and hang it on the wall beside your bed. I've never done the same. Uh, so there's, there's lots of things in this work, and mainly I want to uh, include them because they kind of take us beyond this, this sort of idea about objects um, and about media, but at the same time offer an understanding of how we explore these media as ways of producing certain types of experience. I've actually put in. So, this is. Does anyone know this woman's work? Orlan? Orlan? Yeah? She's a French artist who I was very much enamoured with when I was doing my, my BA many years ago. Um, Orlan, uh, uh, she's shown here um, having uh, plastic surgery um, to bring her face in line with a number of uh, Renaissance beauties. Um, so I think Mona Lisa's forehead, um, these are, um, I think, bottom of the chin of Botticelli's Venus. Uh, so, uh, and the, the whole, ex the, um, the surgical theatre was, um, she had costumes designed by a fashion designer, I don't know if it was Westwood or somebody. Um, and she read from critical theory as the surgery was being done, probably not all of the time that the surgery was being done. Um, uh, and, and so all Anne's works, starts to explore um, where, or start, is one example that explores how people are, can remake themselves with technology, or, or the ways in which people are remaking themselves with technology. I showed this to a group of undergraduate students and they were like, ah, why, why? And I, I find that really odd that, the, the, that people would be so upset that somebody would um, be more upset about somebody making an artistic statement with plastic surgery than having uh, plastic surgery in, in order to, to chase an ideal that they hadn't even considered where it had come from. Um, uh, Stellark. Uh, sorry. Um, so Stellark as well is um, very kind of over the top and outspoken in, uh, uh, in the way in which he talks about his work, but also explores um, contemporary technologies uh, in how they can reconstruct or recreate the human body. And one of the things that he's interested in is, is really drawing attention to the way in which the body itself has, has, has completely changed within the context of, of science and technology. Um, so he doesn't need a robot to go on. Oh, creativity and what? What's behind the three steps? So I'm talking about these people as being artists. We have uh, um, in Greek thought that um, artists are actually people who reproduce nature faithfully. Um, they created re um, uh, depictions or representations that followed and made visible to us nature's rules. So actually what these people I'm talking about, I think, um, are actually doing something more poetic. They're not, um, this isn't, Stellar's work is not about nature's rules. Um, it's about human rules, or about the opportunities for pro producing new rules. What's the body going to be? These bodies don't exist, they're like leopards with, with, with cans. So I shouldn't keep going back to them. So, um, so actually what poets were understood as being, these, they were the ones who were creative, and that they were the people who were understood as bringing a new world in, into being. And, and there's a particular philosopher who I always go on about, and you know, it's my, my dream up here to be my biggest philosopher crush, was on Richard Rorty. And Richard Rorty um, talks in particular about this idea of poetry. And he talks about Nietzsche's work, I'm going to talk about Nietzsche through Rorty, because that's a safe way to do it. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, one of the things that, one of the ideas that he brings up is this idea of the poetic, um, and the idea um, of, of poetry as being, uh, and, and language as being a way of making sense and describing the world that we are in. Um, and he says that there isn't, this, the, um, there's one model that we have of language, which um, one of Rorty's main um, contentions is about uh, how philosophy, Western philosophy, considers itself to be about figuring out what the best way of representing the world is, the best language, the most accurate language, the mirror of nature, and which you know, we have a language which will, which will correlate objectively with what exists in it. And Rorty claims uh, that this isn't possible. There is no perfect language. And what there are, in fact, is a multiplicity of different languages that we might choose for uh, pragmatic purposes um, to, to use in different ways. And some of those, and, and that's why he appears to fill us up with pregnancy. Um, and so poetry and the languages that we use and, and the languages that we inherit um, allow us to describe ourselves and our, and our world. Um, but he also uh, claims that, that language, the, the, um, he also claims that language uh, and description doesn't just take place when we're talking, but also when we design uh, s systems for understanding things, such as scientific models, <coughs> experiments, instruments, um, images, systems of categorization. Uh, can all be considered as representation. So on Monday we had this question of what's an ex what, why are we doing science models to create models. Those models are representations. And we might choose one model over another in order to do things differently um, and to achieve different ends. Um, So, the, so one of the things that um, the goal of the poet is, uh, as Rorty writes about it, is, is to add or change the language that we are using. Um, it's, it's to create a new way of using language that in some way leaves a mark um, of our own experience of um, And this is quite, quite crucial. So to, to read the scripture, read the scripture differently, we articulate and make recognisable our experiences and what is crucially different about them from other, other people. And we modify through that other people's experiences. So when I describe something in a certain way, I change how you, when I use metaphor for example, I change your ability to perceive that thing. These are all tiny effects. So we modify other people's forms of experience. So, uh, to go back to making up people, this is one of the examples that Ian Hacking uses um, from Arnold Davison's work. Uh, who asked the question, were there any perverts before the last part of the night? <laughs> Anyone know? So, no. in strange ways, but there wasn't a disease category to put those people into. Um, so there wasn't a psychiatrist with especially acute powers of observation to discover it hiding everywhere. Um, it was a disease created by a new understanding of disease. Functional understanding of disease. So the, the category alongside the person, and this is the happy convention, is that people, uh, there's, an, there's an interaction between the, um, the disciplines that make, are making use of these categories and the people perhaps that are um, being defined by those categories that, that allows them to emerge. And there's lots of examples of, of these in the 19th century. Um, but I really like this, I keep finding this thing at the moment, X is now a thing. I don't ever see this on the internet. Mm. Cats and tights are now a thing. <laughs> There's something I find really interesting about the, the, the internet as being this uh, media, communications medium where people um, talk about things that are, you'd never bother to tell anybody about, usually. 
Um, but somehow, because there's a large enough mass, things become things, they become recognizable. The things that people wouldn't usually articulate, um, cats and types is not a good example, um, the th things that people observe in the world, su such as the observation of, uh, of uh, furniture or objects that have faces. You know that? People will photograph them, there's lots of tons of blogs. So that, that's a thing, that, you know, that, ob that observation of that thing. So that people start to build up um, these, these categories, and the categories become reinforced by the observations of them. Um, so, in 1820, official statistics started to be used to analyse uh, people's behaviour uh, across a, a broad range of um, uh, areas, so military, agriculture, trade, um, and in particular, deviance was uh, an interest of, of people making measurements and, and studying people's behaviour. Um, and what Hacking talks about is uh, this whole list of suicide, prostitution, drunkenness, vagrancy, madness, crime, over 4,000 different crisscrossing motives for murder, and 21 classifications for suicide. That, um, talks about. And he says that he, didn't, he doesn't think that these motives or sorts of suicides of these kinds exist until the practice of counting them comes into being. Social change creates new categories of people. Counting is no mere report of development. It elaborately, often philanthropically, creates new ways for people to be. So it's by recognising things that are out there, they, they become rarefied. People get put into that category. They, they um, interact with that category. They identify with it. Now, that, that's something that people can do knowingly. That's people could, that can, something that people could do through services. They can say, oh, I'm this type of person, I'm that type of person. Or they, they can be diagnosed. Um, they can be treated in a particular way. Um, they can become part of a social group based around a particular category. Um, but there's also, knowledge also affects people biologically. So Daniel Mann, the favorite anthropologist, um, uh, of, uh, medical anthropologist, talks about the meaning effect, he extends the placebo effect, um, to talk about the way in which um, meaning about oneself um, or one, one's own category can actually affect people bio biologically. Um, so things like expectancy or conditioning um, cause biological responses to meaning. Um, so it's broadly what we know as the placebo effect. So I guess you placebo effect? <laughs> if I start going in there, then mind. Um, uh, and there's, uh, there's a really nice example here. So he does. So Merman talks about a study of superstitions um, in the Chinese community in um, California and the way in which they relate to people's um, uh, uh, or average age at death pretty gruesome, but he, so here we go, he says, so um, in a survey of 28,000 adult Chinese Americans and 500,000 white controls in California, the average age of death from lymphatic cancer was 59.7 compared to 63.6. And uh, the, the people who, um, who carried out this, this study found that there was uh, a correlation between the um, superstition, Chinese superstitions around the meaning of their birth year, which is associated with Earth in this case, but it correlated with, it, with other causes of death. So what it means is that if you, uh, and that correlated also with people's adherence to the, um, uh, their, their, their level of belief, basically, in these categories. So it means that if you get, uh, if you have a particular belief, um, that you are predisposed to die of a certain thing, and then you get sick with that thing, then you're more likely to die early. You know, I don't know about you, but I think it makes sense. Um, and, and this, uh, and Merman says that these kind of effects are really, really obvious. The effect of biology, on, 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 sorry, of meaning on biology, are obvious as smiling when you see a puppy, or crying when you see a sad movie. Read this so much of the meaning of medicine, of, of and the meaning response, and in the narrowest sense, the placebo effect, is a cultural phenomenon engaged in a complete, complex interplay on the meanings of disease and illness. The 
the modern triumph of a universalist biology tends to blind us to the dramatic variation in the ways that people experience their own physiology based on who, on who they are and what they know. So it's not even necessarily the case that you know, you're more likely to die or not. It's just that you experience your biology differently if you're born in an earth field. And that affects you know, what happens to you. Um, but not just what happens to you, but the quality of experience that you have. Um, so there's, there's lots and lots of examples of uh, people who've analysed um, some of these uh, co-constructions co that come from uh, the cultural interpretation and response to, um, uh, to medical knowledge. Um, so uh, Margaret Locke's work on the menopause, um, but comparing uh, Japanese and Western women, I think particularly the first group that she looked at were in Canada, I believe, um, she uh, found that there's a, a big difference in how people report their symptoms during menopause. In Japan it's much more, uh, women tend to have aching shoulders, but they tend to have a much lower symptom reporting generally. They, uh, hot flushes, um, mm -hmm. Uh, so 10% hot, uh, reported hot flushes versus 38 or 35% in Mass Massachusetts, I think 31 in Manitoba. Um, so there's, uh, and what she s suggests is that um, there's lots of different factors that interact with how people uh, experience uh, the menopause, but in particular there's a set of symptoms that are not in Japan associated with the menopause. In fact, there isn't a menopause. Um, there's, there's a particular um, idea, um, which is similar to one called the cli uh, what's referred to as the climactic, um, which which was originally understood to be this period of older age, um, and both men and women have it, um, but this is in Europe as well as um, in other cultures. Um, and in 1821, um, a physician, Jardin, uh, came up with this term, the menopause. Uh, and said, and it was increasingly adopted by obstetricians and gynaecologists as that discipline developed. Um, and so, uh, I mean, look, quotes uh, this doctor. There's nothing to compare with the almost sudden decay of the organs of reproduction which marks the middle age of women. <coughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> this is something that exists in one place, but not necessarily in another, or it exists differently. So the, there are biological things happening. But the way in which they're described by the medical profession then caused them to be different experiences, and in a way that um, politically is um, slightly loaded. Um, hypertension is a disease category that was produced by a new instrument, um, blood pressure measurement. Um, so uh, the reason that we get we're diagnosed, according to Professor Vignier, is with with uh, hypertension is because it's really uh, it was discovered. Um, in the development of bacterial tables for uh, um, insurance companies. So uh, it's great to know, uh, to be able to predict whether or not people are going to die. As far as the Hippocratic Oath is concerned, do no harm. If you diagnose someone before they're experiencing anything, then you're kind of, uh, there's, there's, you're getting into slightly dodgy territory. Of course, the, there's preventative medicine on anyone. But there's, there's lots of debates around breast cancer screening, um, around uh, uh, antiviral drugs for HIV and mandatory screening for HIV. All of these things that um, are instrumentally produced illness. So people that don't, are not experiencing any illness, when you, you can over-diagnose and actually produce negative, um, a whole range of negative effects. Uh, probably, there's many, many of these. Love sickness, that was a thing for a while, it's not a thing anymore. Um, <clears throat> so the, the dangers of excessing love, amorous melancholy, um, nymphomania and satyrosis. <laughs> um, so different, so Napoleon's personal physician described the circumstances where erotic love strikes at the heart of a lover in a paroxysm of passion or malignant fever. So these are like re understood as being real biological problems that people have with being diagnosed. Um, uh, hetero and homosexuality, at one point not only was there not homosexuality but there also wasn't heterosexuality. 
Um, they're defined as distinction from one another. So there were same-sex acts, um, and a whole range of different understandings of what uh, sexual acts could be. There's a kind of broad, much broader um, uh, it was on a longer list. Um, uh, there's kind of now been, you know, there's a more homogenous kind of idea. Um, and, and so Bert Hansen talks about homosexuality as not being discovered, but being something that came about for an interaction between um, urban living, social formation, new medical ideas. Um, uh, so groups of people forming and sharing ideas amongst one another in neurology and you know so this these are things that that come into being that we think of as being very extremely fundamental to who we are but actually the awful ways of understanding of, of ways of living and understanding who we are and what we are um, uh, finally monica casper and uh, whose work is commented on and used by karen barad um, in her meeting the universe halfway um, talks about uh, fetal ultrasound and studies of fetal ultrasound, where, which um, it's now very popular to have 3D ultrasounds. But they're not seen as medically useful, um, but they offer a portrait of the baby. So that's nice, that's fine. But what Monica Casper has uh, looked at um, was, or, just, or argues, is that um, the way in which when we produce a portrait, of the baby, we produce a subject, we produce a person, uh, and that has ramifications for how the mother thinks about her body, but also how other people around the mother think about her body. So it becomes a housing for this, this baby. And so in situations where the child ha needs to have surgery in the womb, that sort of thing, um, the, 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 the whole criteria about risk, who it's for, all these things is subtly altered by the way in which the baby is talked about. It becomes, it becomes a baby, it becomes a person, it becomes sex, it has an identity. And so this is a very different way, you know, these, these things are subtle but... Um, so, as Brad says, the fetus is not a pre-existing object of investigation with inherent properties. It's a phenomenon that is constituted and reconstituted at historically and cultural, culturally specific iterative interactions of material discursive apparatus. I'm not going to talk about what those are. Thanks. Um, okay, so, so what, basically what I'm arguing, or probably laboring, is the idea that labels, descriptions and norms produce certain types of beliefs. Individuals um, describing possibilities produces, uh, describing possibilities and also things like um, experiments, measurements, tests, instruments for identification, um, appropriate actions for these things are all productive in, in themselves. Um, and so often the invention of new categories follows movements, um, uh, power shifts in different uh, things. So this is what I was thinking about, um, which is that for those of you that are doing a project about creativity, you're, you're contributing to what creativity will be. Um, you're not just describing what's already out there. By making, you know, by proving certain things about it, you're actually <coughs> producing it. The fact that we've gotten funding for certain people like, reifies that thing as an object. It makes it more real. The world's a big mess. And we're finding out ways to talk about it. It's a really big mess. Um, it's super, super complex. We take things and we separate them out from other stuff and we try to make make good, useful ways of talking about it. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes we make leopards with <laughs> gardens and stuff. I don't know. Um, so, I, I think thinking about what our premises are, thinking about the language that we use and what, what the underlying ideas that inform why we're doing, why we're learning what we're learning, um, you know, why, why is it important to know about this thing? Who are we defining it for? Who's that going to be useful for? You know, there's, there's almost a, there could be a power struggle going on here between the humanities and, and the arts and, and the sciences because, you know, who gets to define creativity? It's ours. We want it to be undefined. We don't want, you know, Lawrence's tick boxes. <laughs> you know, this, this, so this, you know, this, I think it's very interesting. Um, so, uh, 
yeah. I mean, the, the um, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I mean, this, this um, in particular, in, res in response to what uh, Lawrence was talking about uh, earlier, I, I think, you know, so what I've tried to do is to kind of almost offer a, um, uh, a, a colonization from, from the art side, the side uh, uh, by putting, uh, by suggesting that some of the things that people are doing through the process of research are, are, are more in line with, with how people understand what they're doing in the arts than, than, than the kind of the way in which they're often described um, in other, by disciplines that, that they're taking place in. So I'm kind of applying our language and criteria to I don't want to talk about you know, <laughs> it's quite difficult not to. So uh, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do. So thank you, I'm going to stop. And uh, any questions that's um, referred to many. This, this idea of, of, of using different language to describe our, our experience or of re-describing the world. So he's not necessarily talking about creating a new or different reality that we can go into, although that could be taken as a metaphor for that reality, I guess. Um, but actually about how we describe what it is to be alive. And actually, there's a fantastic poem that he uses in fact, I should have read just to um, exemplify this. It's about, um, yeah, figuring out ways to talk about our own ex experience and to put it into words, which then changes how we uh, experience ourselves. And I think we can, um, I'm trying to think of it. I mean, I think even, even when, if I draw a, a, an abstracted image of something, I'm guiding the way in which you then see that thing. So look, this is like the, the sun. But you know, these things structure how we are able to do things. So, the, the idea of, um, so I think it's about describing our experience uh, rather than just creating new reality. Sorry. But it does create a new reality. Thanks. Regarding to the purpose example, um, you could also like uh, put the question, um, has there been radioactivity before uh, 
1870 or something like that. Um, that we might have, people might have observed that when they come close to certain minerals, they got sick or something like that, but they would ascribe it to other things. Uh, and then somebody comes and labels it, uh, gives it a name, distinguishes it from other phenomena. Does it mean it comes in, into existence, or does it just mean it, uh, its, its form of existence changes, actually? I mean, there has been radioactivity. We, we can assume that there has been radioactivity uh, before my career. They probably, they probably <laughs> they want to take their different name, names for it, um, uh, most likely existed. Um, so, so we're talking about different. We're talking maybe about a change of uh, of existential modes uh, in uh, uh, in contrast to saying it, uh, existence to be binary and say non-existence existence. And it's it's different forms of existence, mm -hmm. uh, even if they don't we don't have names for them. I mean, one of the people that I think is really interesting talking about these kind of ideas is uh, a sociologist of science, Bruno Latour. He's now Kind of blossomed into the philosopher. And, uh, but he talks a lot about how um, uh, different ideas or, or um, uh, practices uh, mobilize sets of, using his terminology, how do I say this in English? Um, that, like something like radioactivity uh, mobilizes a whole set of technologies, of techniques, of people, of, of knowledge systems, of, of actions, you know, conversations. You know, you know, certain types of disease, you have ways of treating it. Yeah, so it becomes more of a thing. I think that's the thing is that, that, that there's, yeah, a, a kind of the reality of something is, is changed by it. Um, yeah. So you, it is really useful to think about that. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. That's your, there's a lot. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's like, no. I don't know what to leave out. No, but I mean, uh, two separate sets of points, following each from Paula and from Michael. Um, the, the, the part that you pointed out um, that is interesting because it reminds me of a book about art and science that I read, um, which um, I'm, I have the, the description here. This is from the blur in the back. It's um, by Sean Eat, Sci Art and Science. Have you read that book? Is science the new art? Scientists weave incredible stories and invent wild hypotheses and ask difficult questions about the meaning of life. They create visual images, models, and scenarios that are gruesome, baffling, and beguiling. They say and do things that are ethically and politically shocking. And so what's interesting is these are things that um, have traditionally, I suppose, belonged to the realm of, of the arts. Um, and so it seems like over time, there's been just kind of this back and forth thing between these two. And I, I read, I'm not a historian of, of art and science, but you know, at, at, at one time, um, the artists of the courts of the, the European kings were also the alchemists, and so, so anyway. The separation is actually very new. Pardon me? The separation is very new. And when was such a sharp distinction made anyway? Exactly. But, uh, yeah. So that's, um, we learned that. And then um, the idea of like, things becoming defined as a, as, a, as a function of language and how we describe them. In, in the Philippines, um, Elders get very upset when you get rained on and the rain evaporates on you, and they say they're going to get sick. And I suppose like, you could just think of it as, well, then your body temperature gets lowered and you're more susceptible. But even if it's just a slight rain, um, like somehow that's a, that's a huge concern, and, and that's kind of a point of argument you know, like me and my father, that's not a story. Um, um, but also, there was a New York Times article, um, I don't know who, who did the original research, that suggested that in the mid-1950s, there was a change in what psychiatric disorders were being reported in Hong Kong. Um, people used to complain more about bloatedness and feeling kind of gassy. And then over time, that disappeared and was replaced by anemia, um, sorry, anemia, um, bulimia, anorexia. So certainly, there's, there's, it seems that our con of, of mental illness have, have changed um, and have been kind of westernized. Um, my final point, sorry. <laughs> is that I think what overall what your talk underlies is some of the um, difficulty you've been having in pinning down that term creativity. Because, you know, is creativity something that exists out there? And really we're just trying to, you know, come to an agreement, you know, what is it that narrow down the term, figure out which part of the creativity is, or are we actually defining it as we go along? So it's kind of a, you know, a, a snake biting <laughs> its own tail. Thanks. Thanks.
что вы вот, мы пришли, что так и строили на марте, мы не сели в этой области, то есть идти в радиоактивити, до Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't. 